Welcome to the one within all, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of Interverse. I'm your host, Chance Garten, and today I've got yet another enlightening conversation to bring you with a fantastically caring and fiercely intelligent guest named Denny Vaughn. Denny is the host of her own podcast on blog talk radio called Heartfelt Awakening, a show dedicated to helping you align your body, breath, and spirit. The idea of balancing these foundational parts of self is a classic spiritual concept, but just because everyone's probably heard these words doesn't guarantee we all know exactly what is meant by them. Of course, I'm all about pointing our perspective towards the inner peace that we always carry within, but like you, I'm also a human who gets tripped up on personal delusions and prejudices, so I really look forward to this chat we're about to have for the reminder and reinforcing of the real truth, which is the fact that we are all infinite beings with an inner world that is both empty and still yet also containing the entire so-called outside universe. Denny has a great message to share about her own journey overcoming past trauma and the cancer that it brought to her experience in life, an affliction she defeated and transformed into a vehicle for bringing others to a closer connection with their own authentic selves. So. Make sure you check the show notes for links to Denny online, including her podcast, Heartfelt Awakening. Show her some internet love and appreciation and join us in mentally setting our intentions for this pod to be cast into the deepest and furthest reaches of our hearts where we can sow and water the seeds of self-love and gratitude to help us grow our inner gardens into the abundant and green worlds we are all yearning to create. Thanks for being here, Denny, and welcome to the universe. Thank you, Chance. Uh, this invitation is so wonderful. I'm just honored and privileged to be here. Well, we have our mutual friend, Linda, to thank for hooking us up. You're the second guest she has helped me score, so I owe her a big time. Hope to have her back on the show soon. But yeah, let's talk about what you do for others. Uh, introduce yourself. Well, um, I guess I can, I call myself a spiritual teacher and um, transformational mentor. And what I do is I point people to say, hey, this spiritual awakening stuff that you're going through, it's not religious, it's physics. And when I say physics, it's naturally us because we don't see that nature and physics show us two parts are required to create a whole and we are called human beings for a reason we also have two parts to create a whole and so when you align with the laws of nature you create the shift and you can access the source of your power and so i always tell people it's my heartfelt purpose to guide you to awaken to this larger part of you and this is where your power is to heal and i know i say power but it's more like plugging in you plug into the natural source that animates your physicalness, if you will. And then you heal on a level of physical, emotional, and spiritual. And this creates harmony within the mind, body, and spirit. So uh, in a nutshell, that's pretty, it's a lot to say what I do, but guiding people to this and, and myself having discovered this space, like you mentioned, getting a diagnosis of cancer and having to deal with that death knocking at you. Hello, death is here. You got two years to live. What do you do in that situation? So this has been a 17 year journey for me, really. I like that you are saying that the spiritual awakening process is physics because the reason religions have lasted as long as they have as institutions is because there is at the core an experience like you're describing that many people are able to tap into through the religious symbolism and through their, but really what's happening is they're just using that symbolism as a scaffolding to express their own inner power and inner connection to source. But because religion often puts these in, these things in the trappings of mysticism, we get everything supernaturalized. And then once we're in that realm, we're like, my story's right, your story's wrong. And it turns into a, a, a bloody mess. <laughs> so, the difference between mysticism and the true mystic is what you're describing, is that the is the the core recognition of the beauty of life and of self that unlocks the healing, I think. That's that's what we're looking at. I agree. And the difference between taking on someone else's experience you know, Jesus or Buddha or what have you, and then following those from the human aspect, 
we just can't do it. But when you experience the shift that the Buddha and Jesus and all those other masters and sages are pointing you to, when you experience this, this is the difference. It's between religion telling you how it is and how you should be and how you should behave in order to get these gifts that heaven is going to give you later on, or stepping into it and experience it and having the gifts right now. So what was your life like before and after your cancer scare? You know, I I grew up in Chicago. I was one of several kids. (laughs) So I was actually the second oldest girl. I have an older brother. And so growing up, I experienced trauma growing up between the ages of four and adolescence. And I uh, escaped that (laughs) and got married very young. Wonderful man. We are still together, 33 years together, together 35. And he actually has been through this journey with me. And I just made a decision after my second child was born to help. And so I made the decision to go back to school at age 27 and get into a career of, I was a communication expert between the deaf world and the hearing world. I was a sign language interpreter for 20 years. So I really just focused in on that and succeeded and went for it. And by the age of 35, I was at the top of my career. I was nationally certified. I had all of these wonderful outward successes going on. I was entrepreneur. I was making the money on the outside. I looked successful. I looked like I had it all. However, I wasn't dealing with past traumas. I kept suppressing them, making them go away. And at age 35, actually it was on my 35th birthday that the doctor called and said, I am so sorry to tell you this, but the diagnosis is malignant melanoma. And he told me some of the things that I had to do. And one of the things I had to do was go see an oncologist surgeon. And, you know, just that day, it's like, oh, my God, malignant melanoma. I look it up. (laughs) I look it up. What the heck is that? I look it up. It's not just cancer. It's bad cancer. I mean, malignant melanoma. Mal is bad. (laughs) Malignant bad cancer. It's like, oh my gosh. And so, you know, I went to the doctor and the doctor started spewing out all of these steps that I needed to take. And, you know, inside you're just like thinking, oh my gosh, what do I do in this situation? And he proceeded to tell me, we're going to inject you with radioactive dye to remove some lymph nodes. And that will determine if you're going to get radiation and chemo, he had already decided that I was going to have chemo, but he was still trying to decide if I was also going to have radiation. And so all of this information is coming at me. And what do you do? You know, what do you do in this situation? And when he said, when I get back from vacation, we'll schedule it in two weeks. And my kids were, I want to say seven and 12 at the time. They're six years apart. So uh, my boys, we were getting ready to go to a trip. I was going to a conference and in, in Florida, Orlando, and my youngest sister was going to come with to take the kids to Disney World two weeks after he got back. And so I'm thinking my whole life, everything that I have is non-existent anymore because he's like, no, you cancel your trip. And something in me, something in me just said, this is not for you. This is not for you. And so (laughs) my 12-year-old bitch came out and said, you cancel your trip and tell my seven-year-old he's not going to Disney World. And I left and I, I stayed with that little pop that came up that said, this isn't for you. This isn't for you. So at one point I have the fear. You know, he's like, well, you know, if you don't do these things, you'll be dead in two years. You know, it's like, okay, so two years, the fear, my family telling me this is the way I have to go, but something in me saying, this isn't for you. And so I realized everything had come to a standing halt and I had to make this life or death decision. And coming to a place where I just said, you know what, 
putting all of that out and just staying in this space where I felt this crack open, if you will, is a tiny little crack open saying, this isn't for you. It's like, all right, well, if this isn't for me, what is for me? And so this started me on a track of learning, taking courses, uh, doing all kinds of stuff. But the decision I made was I'm going to remove the tumor and that's it. So I found a doctor, a surgeon who um, was supportive of me. There were several who were not supportive. No, I am not doing that unless you go down this path. So I found a doctor and I said, this is what I want to do. And he's like, okay. And he referred me to an oncologist who was on board with me 100%. And that I thought was a miracle that I found doctors who were in support of what I wanted to do. And there are some good guys out there. As, as bad as the establishment is, there's still definitely good people in there. Absolutely. And I'm so blessed to be able to find that and work with me on that. So this doctor removed the tumor. And then I saw the oncologist and she said, if you are not going to go down the path of chemo and radiation, you have to go down a path of therapy, your diet, nutrition. What are you feeding your thoughts? And I was like, Whoa, okay. And so I just started doing some research and I started taking yoga. Both my husband and I were at a point where, you know, we need to kind of come together and we decided to do something together. And we didn't know what that was at first. So I would throw something out and he'd be like, nah. And he would throw something out. He's a tennis buff. So he threw out tennis and I was like, nah. So one day I threw out yoga and he said, Okay. And I was a little shocked. I'm like, okay. So we both started taking yoga and the movement within the body and the thought processes that come with it and how your thoughts affect how your body reacts within yoga and how your breath is and all of these things started coming together with my practice. And I realized that this mind-body connection is so key. And my instructor recognized something within me. And I was a a fitness instructor back in the 80s. And uh, she realized that. And she encouraged me to go for training. And I did. And I fell in love with not only the learning process for myself and the benefits that it brought my body, but then teaching others. And so this was the path that just started naturally unfolding because others can see like, oh my God, you've been there, what did you do? And I would just express from my heart, yes, it's scary, but when you stop and listen and put the movement of the world outside and keep this what you naturally are inside, something clicked within me and I realized all of nature, Everything that I was experiencing was showing me something. And this is when it clicked within me that all of the movement I was experiencing, my body, my body going through phases, my body going through the cancer, the cancer is just a manifestation of something else going on. In all of this movement, I started to be able to see, but only from a space of stillness, And within this space of stillness, I understood that I was attaching onto and identifying with that movement and trying to make it a part of who I really was. And I realized I could not take that movement, that identity, that change in with me, in this stillness, the stillness that kind of cracked open a little bit that said, this isn't for you. And I realized it was a shift in perception. And so when I shifted my perception to this stillness, everything that wasn't me was clearly seen. And so this has been my journey for 17 years. And before then, yes, I was involved in in my religion. You know, I do have a Christian background. And so when I come to this space, like we're talking about the masters and the sages, 
I come to a whole new realization and understanding of what those scriptures and those sacred texts are really pointing you to this space within you. And you cannot bring even that written text in with you. It has to be experiential, not knowledge-based, because knowledge-based, our knowledge is constantly changing. And we think, oh, this is what awakening is. And then we have this idea of what it is, but we've never experienced it. That means we've never experienced the shift in perception. Wow, you just had me completely riveted with what, all the story that you just described. And <laughs> got, you really got my thoughts juiced up. And I, I had to take several notes just because everything you're saying completely jives with actual physics of the physiology of our bodies and what has been learned by the great alternative researchers and thinkers out there. I'm thinking specifically of Wilhelm Reich and his theories on bioenergy and what you're talking about with hearing that voice inside saying, I don't want this. This isn't for me. I think that's like your, I, I heard a new concept the other day and it's that we have a third ear, not just a third eye. You have a third ear and it's in your heart. And what goes on with all this identification with the world is an armoring around your heart and your core and all the way out to the extremities of your body and your organs. It's, it's a hardening that blocks the bioenergetic flow that is coming from source out to the skin of who you are. And I think that the ego, our personality is in this, in this particular lifetime is really more connected with and an expression of like it's the outer surface of our physical body. It's not like uh, something that we need to kill or destroy. And in fact, getting into yoga or something that helps you start moving your energy through your body and becoming aware of it, that's how you start healing where your body is holding on to the past traumas and the, and the false identifications. And that removes those layers of armoring. And it allows that bioenergy to flow freely from the core of you all the way to your source. And then, I mean, this happens every day, even if we are armored in that you're awake and your energy is flushed to the surface of your skin and you go to sleep and it all retreats back into the core. This is a natural flow that we all experience every day, but it gets completely blocked up by these traumas and tensions that are li literally live in the body and healing healing those things and getting that flow going actually heals the ego, heals the <laughs> heals the problems with how you see yourself and how you're acting and behaving. I, I think that it's such a great, I guess, symbol of who you really are as a person that you used to do translating and communication for deaf people, because it's not that different than what you're doing now. You're trying to get people who whose third ear has been deafened to start being able to communicate with, again with, with who they really are. So this is all really great. Tell me about how you recovered. So it, it definitely it definitely just started getting better from there or what what was next? I became a course junkie. <laughs> I took everything and anything I could take. I metaphys metaphysical courses, science courses, uh, Reiki courses, energy courses, uh, you name it. Uh, cranial sacral therapy is, I'm, a, I'm also a licensed massage therapist. Cause so I took all kinds of courses on the body, anatomy and physiology, the endocrine system and how our chemicals, um, either connect or explode within us and cause all of these reactions. So I became a course junkie. And so I learned it all. And you brought up something really interesting about the ego, because I work with a lot of people who come with this idea that the ego is bad. I consider the ego like an untrained dog. Have you ever gone to somebody's house and their dog is jumping on you, unbehaved, rude, and all that stuff. Or even like just a kid that you're responsible for. It's your own inner child in a way. Exactly. So really, our ego is just untrained. And we think that's who we really are. But the ego really just needs to be trained. To me, the ego is the filter 
between our internal world and our external world. And so if we don't have that trained in understanding that what's going on inside and what's going on outside, we can't bring what's going on outside inside and we try to. That's when the ego tries to protect us and set up these barriers and these blocks and what have you. It's like it gets turned around. Like it's supposed to be filtering out the stuff from the world that doesn't need to get in and letting out the stuff from within that needs to get out. And it does like the opposite if it's not trained. (laughs) Exactly. And so my ego, when I discovered this space, because the ego is movement, it's energetic movement. And I started to see my ego and I'm like, oh my God, what an arrogant bitch I am. I started to see patterns These patterns that I've had throughout my whole life, one of my PTSD triggers is angry men. (laughs) And so when an angry man would be in my experience, all of these patterns of protecting myself and doing all these things started to emerge. And when I started to recognize, oh, wow, here comes a pattern. Is this angry man really what my pattern is showing me? And I began to see that This person is really expressing what's going on inside them and has nothing to do with me. But I recognize patterns. This is what karmic wheel is. So some of these patterns were given to me by my mother, my father, my siblings. You know, they're habitual patterns that I just do automatically. And so all of these patterns started to become clear. Like, oh, wow, there goes this pattern of being reactive in this situation. So I was able to recognize the pattern, sit with it, allow it, not say, oh, my gosh, I'm being triggered. Recognize I'm being triggered recognize the movement of the trigger, be okay, and using tools. One of the tools I learned, um, one of my doctors was Dr. Mercola after my diagnosis of cancer, and he was very paramount in teaching me EFT, which is emotional freedom technique. And this is just a technique to tap on certain meridians energy lines within the body. So if you tap on those, you're disrupting the pattern. So if I find myself in a pattern, if I can recognize I'm in a pattern, oh my gosh, I am recognizing that I'm being triggered. There's this thing that is happening. I'm feeling the fear coming up. Yes, I'm feeling this. Yes, I had this experience. Yes, my body is responding this way. Yes, there are chemical triggers happening within the body. I am acknowledging because what I was doing before was suppressing or what people are calling spiritual bypassing, it's just another form of suppressing. We're not looking at what's happening. We're pushing it down. And what happens is it comes up so inconveniently in another situation, and then you're still going to have to face it. What you suppress becomes an oppressor because it comes out in the outside world if it's not dealt with with in the inner world. It's exactly, Exactly. because it's not being filtered. Exactly. So I recognized when these patterns come up, I had to deal with it. So I had to take time out for myself, even if it meant canceling my plans and taking that stillness, the time, I needed to take time for the timeless. I needed to stay in this timeless space so that I can recognize my pattern of fear And my pattern of, oh my gosh, chaos, getting lost in the chaos, and then nothing happening with it, you know, still being lost in that movement, coming into the space of, okay, just be, and then the right door will open and it will feel right. So when Dr. McCola came into my experience and I learned these things, I stayed open to them. And one of the things he did was test my body for uh, immune responses and chemicals that I might have within my body that are affecting my ability to for hemo- homeostasis to stay in a healing level. And so I had high, high levels of uranium in my body. Don't ask me how I got that in there. But he said the levels were just off the chart. The chart went up to here. It went off the chart. So he had no idea. Holy shit. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That word. Yes, exactly. So I'm like, 
how did I get high levels of uranium in my body? And then the other thing is, is certain grains such as soy is a big one and wheat. Soy and wheat are the two big ones. Wheat causes an immune response in my body. So it's not really an allergy. Allergies happen right away. My husband has an allergy to nuts. When he has a nut, boom, we know right away, we better get that EpiPen ready. This is an immune response, meaning I eat the food with gluten or soy. Well, gluten has an immune response. It takes up to 24 to 48 hours for the symptoms to begin appearing. And so my body starts to have, my body starts attacking itself as an, an immune response to protect itself. So I have an immune response to gluten and then soy, I have a neurological response. So if I have soy, the nerves on the whole right side of my body begin to go numb. So I began to learn that the food I was eating that everybody was saying, eat this, it's good for you, eat this, it's good for you, was actually poison for my body. And so learn this whole learning process of how this temple for the being that houses my being, this temple is just here temporarily. It's not really mine. It's not really who I really am. And so as I begin to recognize and have respect and love, because in the past with the conditioning that I was conditioned, I believed that I was ugly and not good enough and not worthy enough and that I was a sinner and that I was bad and I had to change my ways in order for God to accept me. So I had all of these belief systems that really I had to see what it was doing to me and see how I identified with them and then be able to create space. This is key. Inner space, I truly believe, is a vital nutrient. We don't have enough inner space to recognize when we're in the movement of fear. We're caught up in it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. All of this fear is happening, and it's causing all kinds of chemical reactions within the body, stress, and all these receptors happening to create space because it's still going to happen. I could still die tomorrow. All of these things are still going to happen, but I have this space to be and be just love and acceptance and nothing. Because I can't bring Denny, the cancer survivor, the PTSD survivor, the interpreter, the massage therapist, the healer, I can't bring any of that in this space with me. The best way that I found to tap into the inner space is definitely meditation. I think that it's a superpower activator. But what I experienced in meditation, even having had a long history with it, is that sometimes out of the blue, I'll be sitting there in calm, silent stillness and some crazy thought will fly through my brain and it won't even, I won't even remember what the thought was two seconds later. You know, it'll just be like, it's just a movement of energy, right? And your brain goes, uh, I think that means this. And it tries to give you a thought that goes with it. And it might even give you, like, I might even have like a physiological almost like fight or flight fear reaction that just pops up out of nowhere while I'm sitting there meditating. And it's in what's interesting is now when those things happen, the thoughts are a lot more interesting and elaborate. But when I first started meditating, it would usually be like, oh, I'm going to die someday. It would be something like that. But the more space that you create in the timeless part of yourself, you carry that with you and inside you the rest of your life. Every time you meditate, it's like you're growing that inner world. And the bigger you blow that up, that dimension within you, the, the more you expand your consciousness in that sense, the smaller all of that movement gets. And you can see how it all connects to each other on a bigger and bigger scale, bigger and bigger picture. So <laughs> I love what you're saying. I, I, I agree pretty much wholeheartedly that we need to be cultivating that part of ourselves because that's where our power is the more that we realize that everything we feel, think, see, experience is temporary, but that our eternal perspective in, inside is never going to change, that 
makes everything a lot more safe feeling, I would say. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, the word meditation actually means to become known. And so what we're doing and how I teach meditation, um, I myself have learned a lot of meditations, including transcendental meditation. All of them are absolutely wonderful. But meditation, I think we have a little bit of a misunderstanding of what it is. Meditation means to become known, but what is it that's becoming known? What's becoming known is our awareness and our awareness is a hot commodity because your awareness and your attention. So you were just talking about how you're in meditation and then all of a sudden this thought comes, I'm going to die, right? So this, and you're aware that this thought is coming, right? You're aware that this thought comes. And so our choice in that moment, and most of us don't see this choice our choice in that moment. So I'm meditating and I'm, I'm in this beautiful, vibrating, expansive, nothing. And then all of a sudden this thought comes, you're wasting your time. This is stupid, right? I'm not good enough or I'm going to die. Whatever that thought is, it's just the mind. The mind comes and says, you're wasting your time. This is where we don't see we have a choice. My awareness now looks at this thought, you're not good enough, or this is a complete waste of time. This is our awareness. We are now turning our awareness to it. And then I have to buy into the thought, right? I have to buy into it. So I'm meditating, beautiful space. You are going to die. Boom. I am now putting my attention on. I am going to die. Oh my God, I'm going to die. I just bought into it. I just put my awareness on it. Now I'm feeding it. How to transcend it. And this is what transcendental meditation does. It'll give you a mantra. And anytime your thoughts go off, you come back to your mantra. However, you don't need a mantra. You need awareness. (laughs) When you're (laughs) off on a thought and then suddenly you find yourself in the movement of the thought and then boom, you become aware You transcend it by removing your attention from it because your attention feeds it. You remove your attention from it and it might still come back and say, hey, what are you doing wasting your time? Hey, you got so much stuff to do. You know, the mind will still be like, hey, pay attention to me. Hey, it wants it likes to do puzzles and and it wants to do something. It's, It's what the mind does. It's what it does. We can't change that. It's what it does. So instead of trying to stop the mind or stop the ego or kill the ego, you transcend it. Transcending it means you raise, maybe you not even raise. You're withdrawing attention from it. You're no longer feeding it. And as it starts its movement again, it's seen. But you can also, like we are going with the metaphor of the mind being kind of like a child that you're responsible for or your own inner child, whenever it brings you those thoughts, my particular way of transcending it, I guess, as I've developed my own meditation practice, I don't quite accept it as in like go along with it. But when the thought comes up, I just, I'm just like, okay, (laughs) there, there's that. So I don't, I don't go, oh no, no, no. And ignore it in, in a repressive way. Like we brought up earlier, I completely acknowledge that it's there. I completely, I guess in a way, honor that that part of me is communicating to me. I acknowledge it. I give it a small fraction of attention as in I go, I know that that's there and that's in me. So it's not, so that's part of using the power of your attention is not only withdrawing it after you've made the connection, but don't deny the fact that you're thinking it, I guess. You gotta make sure the spiritual bypassing part always comes in through like the denial aspect, I would say. So that's been my experience with it, and, and it, it works just like you're saying. It You transcend, and eventually when those thoughts come, you don't even have to do that whole process that we just described. It just is like Superman getting shot with a gun, and it bounces off. <laughs> Exactly. And, you know, acknowledging and thanking it. So I have so many times, you know, you know, meditation, many, many years of meditation practice and getting to the point of because the thoughts are going to come. They are going to come. It's what the mind does. And so just a simple thank you and acknowledging and then coming back 
to the perception of this expansiveness, this shifting in perception. So we're shifting into the movement of thought and then we shift perception to stillness and expansive, unlimited beingness. And so when we know, I, I like to call it penduluming. <laughs> so we're in the bliss. Oh, yes, yes, yes. This is wonderful. And then we pendulum out into the crazy movement. And then we kind of go through this phase of, oh, my gosh, I lost my awakening because I'm now out in the movement. You didn't lose it. You're in the perception of the human part of you. And then you pendulum back into the being. What I guide people to do when they're in that place when they're in, oh, yes, here's the awakening that I love so much. And then, boom, I'm in life and I'm caught up in it. And, oh, my God, you're penduluming it back and forth. Become aware of the one who's going in and who's going out. This is the one you want to connect to because when you come. Yeah. Yeah. You're, uh, no, it's click, it totally clicks with me what you're saying. The, another definition etymologically of meditation is to carry to the middle. And what I would like to tell people who maybe don't have a meditation practice or even that do as far as like, how do you get into that bliss zone you're talking about? Maybe some people don't even get past the part where they're just sitting there going, now what do I do? Which is totally, totally understandable, especially if you don't have a lot of experience. So carry to the middle or bring to the middle, balance, center. Think of ways that you can literally, like physics, put that idea into practice while you're sitting there. So for me, that involves trying to make sure my weight is is perfectly balanced between my left and right side as I can. I might count the amount of heartbeats that my in-breath and my out-breath take and try to balance the in and the pause and the out and the pause to be three parts equal, something like that. And it doesn't have to be just like that for you. Just if what you're focusing on is that part that you just said, the the part that's moving the pendulum, the not the pendulum itself, you can find that part by looking for ways to physically bal bring balance to yourself in that moment of uh, sitting there quietly. So that that's what I wanted to add. You really sparked me there. <laughs> I love that. And, you know, I teach as human beings, we, uh, just who we are has two names, right? Human beings. So as the human part of us, what does that entail? It entails the body, all of the chemical responses in the body, my memories, my programming, my gender, my skin color, all of those things are, are in energetic movement, constantly changing, never the same, here temporarily. I call them sojourns. It has a beginning, a duration of time, and an end. So you're, when you're in that movement, where am I perceiving from? I'm perceiving from the energetic movement. And so when you're caught up in that movement, you can just ask the question, where am I perceiving from? The human constantly changing, moving <laughs> craziness or the being, the center part of you that's holding it. And so I love to use examples in nature and in physics to show us how we are the same. And so some of the examples I use are like the scale. So the scales have the parts that move and weigh, right? They're constantly moving, changing, never the same. But the scales can't move without the fulcrum. The fulcrum doesn't move. And so the scales are moving. The fulcrum doesn't say, hey, you're too low. Get way back up there. It doesn't judge. It doesn't have opinions. It doesn't direct. It doesn't do anything other than hold space for the scales to move. We have the same thing where we can perceive our perception could be in the moving scales. Oh, my God, things are so great. This is wonderful. Oh, my God, things are getting bad. Oh, my God, I don't want to go this direction. So we're caught up in the movement of it. But what we don't know is that we also have the perception and it takes a shift. And a couple of scriptures from my Christian background came to mind, two of them actually, where Jesus said, the kingdom of the heavens is within. This tells me we have an experience that is so big, so massive, so beautiful, and it's inside. The other thing he said that really hit home to me and helped me with this, no flesh 
can enter the kingdom of the heavens. That means who I think I am, Denny Van, I'm a female, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a sister, I'm a daughter, I'm all, la, 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 all of these things. None of that can enter the space. That means I got to be nothing to enter the space. And if I'm willing to let go of everything I think I am to discover the massive, beautiful, everything that I already am, Am I willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? It's, it causes a lot of fear in the psychological mind because the psychological mind thinks it's going to die, thinks it's going to go insane, you know, because it has to let go of control. And really, there is no control. It thinks it has control. But all of these things are happening. And if we are aware of it, and you get to the point where <gasps> I'm feeling that vibration and it feels scary and, oh my gosh, I don't want to let go. Oh yeah, that's right. If this part is going to happen, if we know that this is coming and we're aware of it, then boom, that shift happens. And it's such a wonderful thing to see when somebody lights up, you know, because their inner, their being is so constricted and put in this tiny little box inside because we have all of these things that we have to be, you know, and when they find this, it explodes. They're like a dead light bulb. You know, we, our physicalness is like a light bulb, but when you plug in that light bulb and the light comes off of it, you can't tell where that light begins and ends. But most of us, we only see we're just the light bulb and we're not plugged in. And as soon as they get plugged in and their light shines, oh my gosh, <laughs> Well, it's been demonstrated in scientific experiments I, or measurements, I guess, that your body actually emits light, believe it or not. it's not, And different people have different levels of photonic emission. And on top of that, the cells in your body have light reading receptors. So that one person who lights their own inner fire can literally spark every other person on a biological level there is a energy connection not just in like the electromagnetic fields between us but in the light the very light that comes off of us in a literal sense can be either diminished or enhanced by having a lot to do with that at the actual flow of the bioenergy through your physical vehicle and to do with that armoring we brought up before the psychological armoring that becomes physical tension all based in uh, trauma and PTSD and that kind of thing, which unfortunately we've got a society that's been very well crafted to make sure that everybody has at least some form of PTSD. And it's funny because a lot of people's things that give them trauma, and not saying everything, some stuff is like legitimate fucked up trauma, but a lot of people's things that are trauma for them wouldn't even have phased our ancestors wouldn't have been. And there's something that comes out of like Viking and Celtic uh, ancient peoples that they would carry, they considered their traumatic experiences to actually be their armor, but not in the way that we're talking about. They looked at those experiences as like, this is what made me who I am. I'm tough. I'm strong. I went through all this and it made me great as opposed to like the, oh, poor me, this bad shit happened to me when I was young. Now, I'm not saying that a lot. It, it's not warranted that stuff could be traumatic that happened to us as kids. But my, my, my point is that it's all in how we look at it. It doesn't matter what happened to us. It could be, or it could be a boost or it could be a detriment. And it's just completely up to you. That is free will. Because when I had the diagnosis of cancer 17 years ago now, um, I started telling people, uh, you know, close family members and, their reaction is very interesting because that free will, I started to see I could go down that path of poor me, I have cancer, pity me, give me this kind of attention. It's, it's really attention. Or I decided to just not tell people about during the time of my healing because it brought on something that I didn't like. I didn't like going down and 
identifying with that part of me because I knew it wasn't me. However, I felt it was very easy to go down that path because as a society, you know, we identify as a victim, a rape victim, a cancer survivor, a trauma survivor. We start to identify and take that on as who we really are, but it's not who we really are. And this is, this is, where we can exercise our free will to go down that path or to say, no, this is not who I'm identifying with. And that's very powerful. And as a society, look where we are right now. We have someone who might not have emotionally matured past the age of 12 running the country and therefore behaving in such ways that are triggering a whole bunch of other people in our country. And so we are very raw right now with these emotions. And so if we can just create a little bit of space inside, we'll realize, wow, the more we look at this, the more as a society, as a culture, as a society, the more we all look at this, the more we tip the scale to feed it and have more of that in our experience. And I kind of call that mass relativity. You know how Einstein talks about relativity. It's my center and how I am perceiving it. You know, where are you looking at the scales? Are you looking over here? Somebody else could be looking over here. It's all relative, right? But as mass relativity, as a society, if all of our society is looking at what they don't want, we're going to get more of that. But if we can all stop looking and stop feeding and say, you know what, this is what I don't want, but what do we want as a society? We need to start looking at and feeding what it is we want and not even giving attention to that because our attention as a society is a hot commodity. I don't know if you can see that right now. Our attention on a mass level is a hot commodity. So the more people that are looking at something, the more they're feeding that. And if we can just see, if we can, all of us together, we are, we are so powerful together come together and not look at that and let's just start feeding what it is we want. We're going to have a mass relativity shift. And this mass relativity is what causes fish to go suddenly this direction, causes swarms of birds to suddenly this go this direction. So as a society, we have to come together to say, you know what, we're not feeding that anymore. Boom, let's look at this. And all the corporations that are trying to get us to do things or buy things in fear because we need these things. We really don't need these things. But if all of this is happening and we remove our attention from it, that's going to go away. The, yeah, the armoring that we're creating is to keep us from our personal responsibility. Like the, the hiding from looking at the inner world is to keep drowning out that inner voice or closing the third ear so that we don't hear the part of ourselves that says, I think this needs to change. And we can keep going along with what everyone else is doing because that's the easiest path of least resistance. But personal responsibility is the key. And that involves a degree of selfishness that is not the way that society has taught us to believe selfishness is. What real selfishness is, is taking care of yourself and doing what's right for you at all times and all places, which because this is a fractal universe that is actually all inside you, as soon as you start doing that, you actually become the best person for the job in any situation that you're ever called to that does involve the outside world. You actually start being able to help. And when you aren't taking good care of yourself, a lot of us want to help the world. We want to find a way to heal planet Earth. We want to fix the divisions in, in humanity. But until we rectify those divisions in ourselves, all we do is perpetuate that going on going forward with with everybody else so i think that's a key component to keep in mind is the the spiritual selfishness and literal physical health selfishness your health is your wealth that's you you don't need to make a bunch of money to help the world you need to live a life of example of being in balance and harmony and that the literal universe of billions of bacteria and and cells that make up your body will 
that's like a, a fractal reflection of the billions of planets that are going to be affected by your energetic shift towards being responsible. And what responsibility is, is just knowing what is right from your own inner voice, from the source. We all have that. It's, a, it's totally tied into conscience. We're getting kind of close to the end of the free hour. So let's take this chance to plug your shows and give people links to where they can find you and, and close out for our free audience. Excellent. Well, you can find me on heartfeltawakening.com and most of my social media handle is Heartfelt Awakening. And we have a wonderful group uh, on Facebook called Heartfelt Awakening Village. And right now we are doing a 10-day meditation challenge. And you know the meditation is not the challenge. The challenge is committing to 10 minutes twice a day for 10 days. And just that commitment to doing it causes a domino effect within you. So yes, definitely come check us out. Yeah, that, that is a huge thing, building up that meditative momentum. Because once you're doing that, then you start meditating when you're not sitting and breathing in a still place. The stillness goes with you out into the world. You'll be out in traffic and someone will do something really dumb in front of you that before you would have been like, and the Martian war god would come out of you and you'd be calling the DMV and getting their license plate, figuring out their name and then tracking them down. And you're imagining all that in your head. Instead, they cut you off and you go, oh, whoops. And you just like keep driving and it's like nothing happened. It could be like that for you. <laughs> it's just a boop, 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 done. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, we'll take a quick break and then come back and do hour two. I've got, I didn't even touch my questions for you. So <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can get to those in a little bit. another episode down thank you guys for joining us for another amazing episode denny it was a blast to get to know you and i appreciate linda clay who was a previous guest of the show for putting us in touch for such a fantastic conversation it was really amazing to hear her story about coming overcoming cancer quite inspirational you know if i ever get cancer someday that's who i'm going to talk to although i don't think i'm going to get it <laughs> and i don't think you're going to get it but I guess a lot of people do get it. There's many reasons for that. One thing that we kind of glossed over in the conversation was EFT or emotional freedom technique. And that's a really amazing set of practices that are very simple. You can look up EFT online and find probably hundreds of people willing to show you how it's done. And it's almost like just a symbol of wanting to let go, relax, release stress and tension from the body. And whenever you're telling yourself that's what you want to do and you take action, almost any kind of action to make that happen, that magical placebo effect of your own mind over matter ability definitely comes into play. So changing your attention, changing your actions, EFT is a good way to do that. And speaking of attention magic, we can change any thought we ever want to change and we can be as aware as possible about what's going on in our heads and we can empower ourselves that way one thing i used to tell people i don't know why i don't make this comment anymore but i used to go around <laughs> like at music festivals occasionally and ask people if they wanted a magical hater shield and it worked like this i would wave my hands around and i'd say there's your shield it's on <laughs> anytime that you think that somebody is having a bad thought about you or judging you or you're judging yourself or you're having a judgmental in a negative way thought about other people around you. Remember that you got a hater shield and that that mental hater that's in your brain can be blocked by this hater shield. And every time you remember that you have the hater shield and let go of the judgmental thought about yourself or about others, 
then your hater shield gets stronger because you're more likely to remember it again the next time since you've been putting it into practice. So you've all got hater shields. You're all attuned for Reiki. And if you listen to the second half of the show, then you definitely got attuned for Reiki. That was one of the big topics we talked about. As far as that discussion went, it was incredible. It was short. It was at the end of the plus extension, but we pretty much covered exactly how someone might try to practice Reiki, the things to watch out for in terms of protecting yourself in that process. Other things we talked about in the plus extension were how to cure the need to please syndrome, NPS, changing yourself instead of trying to fix others, money as an energy flow and shifting perspectives away from negative connotations with it. And she made the point that money is innocent and a lot of the problems on earth that are associated with it, kind of like the old saying, guns don't kill people, people kill people, well money's not at fault for its problems. I don't completely agree that we can fix all the problems with money and commerce just by not paying attention to the downsides. And maybe that's not what she was saying, but we do have to create something conceptually similar with a more clear and positive intention behind it. At least I think, because we're all pretty conditioned that we need to exchange some sort of symbolic medium to make stuff happen in the world, which I guess isn't in and of itself as harmless. Like she said, we talked about, Pythagoras, music, and the quadrivium of classical self-knowledge. We analyze the chakra system in conjunction with Maslow's hierarchy of needs to see what one can work on to fully open up to fulfillment in life. Harnessing your own power of belief for healing, that self-initiated placebo effect I was talking about. And yeah, and then at the end is when we talked about the Reiki, which just means universal light. It's about, it's a system that you can teach yourself or learn from others about channeling the universal field of energy for healing. And we all have that ability. It's not just limited to mystical people. You're a mystical person if you choose to be. You don't really need any seminars or courses to advance spiritually. Although Danny, Danny talked about taking many such types of programs whenever she was in her beginning phases of awakening and I agree that those things could probably be really helpful, but I never took any seminars or courses other than stuff I could find for free online. Pretty much your own self-directed exploration of spiritual topics is going to be your best teacher. However, one thing that you can work with are divination tools because they can really help you become aware of the energy flows and directions of the currents through your life. And I'm talking about stuff like tarot or I Ching or astrology. And there's other types of divination arts out there. Actually, just getting into the creative act itself is going to be maybe the most huge teacher about the energy flows going on in your mind and body. Because if you're trying to paint something or make up a song and you keep thinking about this one thing that's distracting you going through your head, well, there you go. That's telling you what the energy flow is, what you need to work on, maybe letting go or changing in your life. But anyway, that's about the gist of the Plus extension. For those that don't know, you can subscribe to Interverse Plus at patreon.com forward slash Interverse. And by becoming a member, you'll get the full two-hour version of this episode and all of the archived Plus episodes that are there. Really fun stuff. You double, double your pleasure, double your fun with Interverse Plus. So don't miss out on a really good episode that we just published here. I'm sure the free show was still great. I liked it. <laughs> so if you wanted to subscribe, you can check the show notes for links to Patreon. You can find Atya, the music I used in this episode, also linked there, soundcloud.com forward slash A-T-Y-Y-A. Really good new discovery of mine. I love this type of kind of halftime glitchy bass music. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. So Thanks again to Denny for coming on. You can find what she's doing on Facebook with her group, the Heartfelt Awakening group. I'll link to that. And you can also hit her up on Instagram, other social media platforms. I'm sure she'd love to talk to you and answer questions. I'd also love to get in touch if you feel like commenting on this episode or sending me an email or whatever. Please let me know what you think. Thanks for listening. This has been a great time. I am ready to wrap it up and talk to you guys next week. 
I love you all. And keep working on that beautiful art project called Your Life. See ya.